Uh, what a blessing that song is. Whew. Amen. That was wonderful. God bless you. Hope you sing more. I'd like to see her and Lisa do a duet too. As my wife had said as they're going to Sunday school, I'll be speaking at the annual state conference of um, the Fraternal Order of Police. And uh, I've been asked to join the Fraternal Order of Police organization, and I'll be doing that Monday. Tomorrow I'll be riding up to Eastern to, um, to do that. And uh, I'll be opening the meeting, the annual state conference, with the invocation and prayer. And uh, it's, a, it's a great honor to do that. The governor's going to be there. The state representatives will be there. The attorney general will be there. And uh, I'll just tell you, it's a, it's a blessing that God can open doors. When we don't force them open, God just opens great doors. So praise the Lord for that. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's good to be here. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm always glad to be in God's house, aren't you? I got to take my coat off because it's 74 degrees in here and I'm roasting up here. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, I hope you have your Bibles this morning. Amen. I want to speak to you this morning on a very, very serious subject. Uh, I believe that this message today is going to either open doors for you in a way of freedom or it's going to open up the doors of way of bondage. It's all up to you. It's not up to me. I'm only here to give you the message. It's up to you to apply it, take what it says, and do it. Oh, that was weak. Come on. Amen. That's better. Praise the Lord. I want to share with you this morning the power of agreement. The power of agreement. That there is a power... You don't have to stare at me. There's a power of agreement. How many believe that? There's a power of agreement. And uh, first and foremost, I want to ask, the, or I should say, what is the definition of the word agreement? And out of all of the uh, uh, definitions, I found these, excuse me, to be the best. But before we continue, I want to remember... Those that are on Facebook, God bless you. Thank you for joining us this morning and uh, just opening a word of prayer. Father, we thank you. We praise you for your presence in this place. God, we don't want to take it for granted because we know that things are spiraling out of control as far as the world is concerned, religion is concerned, the devil is concerned, evil is concerned. And Lord, we're standing fast. We're holding forth the word of truth. And we thank you and we praise you for that. Now, bless this message, Father, that you've put upon my heart, which is your heart. And, Lord, let me speak it the way that you gave it to me this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Before I get into this, though, I just want to give you a little bit of update of what's going on. I don't know if you heard the recent rant of the Pope lately, and I'm not here to bash the Pope or anything like that, but I want to just let you give you some information of what he's saying. What he's saying now is that the, uh, America needs to turn over its sovereignty to the European Union and the nations. We need to turn over our courts, we need to turn over uh, our guns, everything, uh, to this one world thing. And he said this also, which really shocked me. He said, anyone uh, who is having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, it is harmful and dangerous. I believe that things are spiraling really quick and we better be ready for what's coming next. You know, and you better make sure that your salvation, of your salvation. You know, the Bible says, test to see your faith. Make sure you're in, the, you're in the word of God. Make sure you're in the salvation. So the definition is, how many are accordance in opinion or feeling a position or a result of agreeing? It's a contract. It's a compact. It's a treaty. It's a covenant. Say covenant with me. It's a pact, a cord, a concord, it's a protocol, it's an agreement of military cooperation. But I like this next definition of the word agreement. A negotiated and typically legally binding arrangement between parties as to a course of action. Let me repeat that. 
a negotiated and typically legally binding arrangement between parties as to a course of action. So the obvious is that if agreement is harmony, then disagreement is disharmony. Amen? Come on, don't be so stiff. Relax. Let your shoulders hang down. Everybody's hanging on the edge here, you know, kind of waiting to see the boom here, I guess. I don't know. Okay. In this message this morning, there are three entities that I want to be talking about today in regards to making agreements. And these three are this. Number one, making an agreement with God and what he says. I'll be going into a little more detail about the three. I'm just going to give you the three. Number two, making an agreement with the devil and what he says. And then number three, very important also, making an agreement with people and what they say. Now I want to explain the three of these right now. Making an agreement with God and what he says. You cannot know what God says if your nose isn't in the book. You won't know your promises. You won't know the ag agreements that he has for you. You won't know the, de the desire he has for you. You won't know of the love he has for you or the sustaining power he has for you unless you're in the word. Because the word is him. This is his word. It's like you being on a telephone talking to someone all day long. This is the word. This is God's word talking to you, talking to me. Making an agreement with what God says. Now, I hear people sometimes say these things. God doesn't love me. Ever hear anybody say that? Ever gone through that where you felt like God didn't love you? I'm sure you have. Don't be lying in church now. Okay. Sometimes we feel that way if we're honest. When things don't go right, when people aren't getting saved, when we see our loved ones killing themselves and dying and going to hell, we sometimes feel, well, God, don't you love me? You know, I see the, I see the people in the world prospering and I see them being successful and I see them going through all these things. And yet... Here I am struggling. Here I am going through the hard times. Here I'm going through these things. God, do you love me? Sometimes those are thoughts in our mind. But what does God say? It's one thing to read it. It's one thing to speak it. But it's another thing to believe it. What you believe will be shown in your life. You can say you believe all you want all day long, but how you act and what you do and what you say will determine what you really believe. So many people have just a Sunday God. Hello? They only want God on Sunday. They don't want God to invade their territory. Don't want God to move in their life. They just want a Sunday God. Well, can I tell you? He's not a Sunday God. He'll never be a Sunday God. He's an everyday God or he's not God at all. Come on, somebody. He's either in your life 24-7, seven days a week. Come on. Or he is not at all in your life. You can pretend, you can make believe, you can say all the nice things, know all the Christian phraseology, but it doesn't make a hill of beans to God. If God doesn't have you 24-7, after all he's done for you, you're not worthy of him. Come on, somebody. Making an agreement with what God says about you. Well, you don't understand, Pastor. I've had people all my life call me ugly or this or that. Well, we're going to get into the people part. But what does God say about you? You have to come into an agreement with what God says. If you don't come into an agreement with what God says, you're going to believe someone else of what they say. 
making an agreement with the devil in what he says. The devil will tell you, you're ugly, you're worthless. What does God's word say? You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I love you with an everlasting love. Come on, somebody. You've got to come in agreement with what God says about you. Forget your past. Forget the hurts. Forget the pain. That's what the devil wants you to do. He wants you to stay there so you won't grow. Come on, somebody. We allow bitterness and unforgiveness Toward those who have hurt us. And we hold on to that thing. Let me tell you something. You will never ever grow in Christ. And you'll never be the whole person that God wants you to be. If you keep making agreements. With your past. Make an agreement with the devil. What he says. The devil will always remind you of your past. He'll always bring up the things that took place. You can't forgive because look what that person did to you. I'm here to tell you this morning, if you don't let that thing go, that thing will eat at you and eat at you like a cancer. And you will find yourself in more situations and circumstances than you really want to be in. And then making an agreement with people and what they say. When you grow up with parents or you grow up with people that are ignorant, and even parents can be ignorant, understand what I'm saying. And they tell you, you're no good. You'll never amount to anything. Why are you the way that you are? I don't want you. I wish I never had you. All of these things that some parents do tell their children. I wish you were never born. And that stays with a person. That stays in their heart because they believe they come to an agreement. And sometimes you sit there and either people will say it to you or the devil will use people to say it to you or the devil will directly say it to you. You're worthless. Let me tell you, if you speak these words, I guess I am worthless. You've just come into an agreement with the devil and that gives him permission to wreak, wreak havoc, you know, make havoc in your life. You come into an agreement, not with what God says, not with what, you know what I'm saying? But you come in agreement with what the enemy says to you. You'll never amount to anything in your life. You say, you know what? I'll never amount to anything in my life. You've come into an agreement. Or the devil will tell you, Your great-grandfather was a drug dealer. Your father was a drug dealer. And you'll be a drug dealer. Or your father took drugs. You're going to take drugs. You're going to die just like your father was an alcoholic. You're going to be an alcoholic and you're going to die. The moment you come into an agreement with the enemy and say, Yep, I'll probably die an alcoholic. Let me tell you something, if you don't believe what I'm telling you. When my mother-in-law passed away, I never forgot this. When my mother-in-law passed away, her brother, at the funeral, said these words, I'm next. And within a year, he died. Right? My times and seasons are in God's hands. When I was in India and I was sick, the devil came to me and he spoke to me verbally. I heard his voice. When a casket went by on the tarmac in India, a casket, a black one, went by in a, in a cot. And the, I heard his voice, very plain as I'm, I'm talking right now. He said, that is going to happen to you. That casket's for you. You're going to die. Now you have to understand where I came from. I was very sick. This is not a joke. 
This is real. These, these things are real. God had already prepared me months before and gave me a promise that he was going to bring me back to this land in America. And as I was being wheeled in a wheelchair onto the plane, I spoke these words out. I said, devil, you're a liar. God gave me a promise. I'm in agreement with what God said. You cannot kill me. It is not God's will for me to go yet. And you can't touch me. And here I am today. Come on somebody. Hallelujah. You've got to come in agreement. With what God says. You'll always be this way. People will tell you. I've heard testimony of doctors tell people, you're going to die in six months. The cancer's all through your body. Can I tell you that was something 25, 30 years ago, the person's still alive today. They may be able to diagnose, but don't put your hope in the, diagno in the, in the diagnosis. Put your hope in what God said. Hallelujah. You can't go from this earth until God, if you belong to him, you can't go until the time that he says that has been appointed. Listen to me. The Bible says it is appointed for man to die. After that, the judgment. It's an appointment. You have an appointment. Every one of us, if the rapture doesn't happen, we're all going to die. You have an appointed. You have an appointed time, an appointed day. You're going to die. We don't know how. We don't know when. That's why we have to really be careful and not think. Like, just because you woke up this morning, that tomorrow you're going to wake up. There's no guarantee. Tomorrow may be your appointed time. You ever go to a meat counter in the market? You take a number? Come on, somebody. You know where I'm going with this, right? Number 46! That's what's going to happen to you. One day, God's going to call out your number. 46! Amen. Now let's look for a moment in God's word as we, we start looking at this with a premise of the power of agreement. Proverbs 18 verse 7 says this. As he puts it up there. And thank God for Pastor Tom. He's not feeling well today. Let's say a prayer for him, okay? Father, we just pray, God, that you touch Pastor Tom and the sickness that's on his body. We rebuke it in Jesus' name. His chest is, his chest is all tight and he's got a, maybe a little warmness, maybe not feeling well, his throat hurts and all that stuff. Oh, yeah, he could have been staying home in bed. You know what he told me? I'll only be watching it on Facebook. Why shouldn't I just come here? <laughs> Praise the Lord. A fool's mouth... Is, say is, his destruction. And his lips are a snare of his soul. Let me explain that to you. It's not the mouth. Your mouth is your mouth. It's what comes out of your mouth. We're learning about metaphors and similes and all that in the Wednesday Bible study. Now you see, now you see, I can see your hair, your, your mind is clicking now, right? You're saying, oh, I see what that means. Yeah. A fool's words, are, what comes out of his mouth is his destruction. I'll never find a job. You never will. I'm never, fill in the blank, you won't. A fool's mouth is his destruction. And his lips, not just the fleshy things on the end of your face here, are the snare of his soul. Hmm. What's your soul? Hear me now. Your soul is made up of your what? Your will. Come on. 
Ever try to do something and you can't do it? You, you, something else always gets the victory over you? You know why? Because your lips became a snare to you. Here's how it works. Person gets delivered from heroin. And one day he's walking down the street. And his buddy comes by and he's got a bag of heroin and he says, Hey, come on, let's get high. He says, Oh no, I've been delivered. I've been free. Yeah, you're free. I understand that. I heard you say that. But you can handle one. How many ever heard that? You can handle just one. You can do it just this one more time because you have power over it. And what happens, instead of having faith in what God's done in your life, you begin to believe what that person says and you come into agreement and say, I can handle it. It becomes a snare to your soul, to your will. and You begin to, before you do it once, then you got to do it twice, then you do it three times, four times. You know what I'm saying? Come on, somebody. And that's what happens. Your mouth becomes a snare because of pride and arrogance. You be, it becomes a snare to you. And you don't get deliverance. That's why, because you have come into an agreement. Oh, I hate the devil. A fool's mouth is his destruction. That's why you got to be careful what you say. Well, Pastor, I'm not talking getting metaphysical now. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is being careful of the words you choose to speak to people and what you say to people because the devil can use you to be a great hindrance in someone else's life. The enemy can use your mouth to be a destructive power and a snare in someone else's soul. Come on, I only got one amen. We're going to look at another verse also. Same chapter, verse 21. Same chapter, verse 21. Death, come on, say it with me, death. Now, do you understand what death is? What is death? Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Now, researching this scripture out, any, before I go any further, it does mean the power of the king to say you live or die. But it also has to do with you and I. If you go over to a child and you begin to tell that child from the day he can understand you're a dummy. You're no good. You're good for nothing. And you begin to pronounce these curses on that person. When that person grows up, they will believe it. They'll believe that there's no purpose for them in life. Because you spoke that over their life. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Let me, let me just give you the, the word meaning there. <clears throat> the word death in the Hebrew there means ruin it means to ruin it means to ruin something that was healthy something that was wholesome is to ruin so death is ruin and life, this word life in Hebrew means to restore. So when you speak to someone, you can either speak 
Words of ruin are words of restoration. The Bible says that God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Come on, somebody. Now, some people will not like this message. Some people won't believe this message. But you'll never get out of your situation if you keep agreeing with the enemy or with people and stop believing and agreeing with what God says. Death, ruin, and life, restoration are in the power or the word in Hebrew means direction of the tongue. Come on, somebody. And they that love it shall eat Hear me now. The fruit thereof. Whether it be death or life. If you love speaking death all the time to people. If you love being negative all the time. If you like, if you like just always giving bad news to everybody all the time. You're going to eat the fruit thereof. What's the word eat mean? Whatever is eaten is for the purpose of of nourishment. Hello? The results are based on what is eaten. Good for you or not good for you? Okay. Now we all have a diet. We all have, you know, things that we eat every day. And we know what's good for us. And we know what's bad for us. And when we eat the things that are bad, it's because we have somehow convinced ourselves or came into an agreement that that's not going to happen to me. I'm not going to gain weight. Yes, you are. Okay. You may smoke a cigarette and say these words. That'll never happen to me. I'll never die of cancer. You can take drugs, drink alcohol. That'll never happen to me. Yes, it will. Because what you nourish yourself with is what you become. Hello? Eating is partaking. Eating is partaking. Don't deceive yourself for one moment thinking that you can eat 14 boxes of Twinkies. Okay? 14 peanut butter sandwiches. What else is not good for you? Chocolate cake. <laughs> That one got me in the side. Popeye's fried chicken. I love Popeye's too. Kentucky fried chicken. Come on, somebody. And think that you will not gain weight. You are deceiving yourself. And you're deceiving your clothes. We think that when something gets a little tight on us, it's because we shrunk it in the wash. <laughs> Come on, somebody. That's what I'm talking about. We become deceptive in our thinking that it won't happen to me. This won't happen to me. Had a dear friend that smoked. For years, God gave me a word for her. Well, it was a Friday night meeting. I don't, I don't know if Bob was there. I don't know if you were there or not that night at Brother Tony's house. God gave me a word and said, there's some people here, you're smoking cigarettes. If you don't quit, you're going to die. That's a popular message to preach among friends. One person listened, didn't smoke till the day they died. The other person said these words, that will not happen to me. Within a short time, period of time, maybe two or three years, 
God would speak to me again and say, go tell that person to stop it. God's mercy. God's mercy. You need to stop it. You're going to die. Not me. The very thing that she had an agreement with but was living a lie because, like I said before, what happens is it's a snare to your soul. And I remember one night while I was sleeping, I awoke, shot up in bed. I don't know how that happens. I don't know how that happens. Your hands are beside you, and all of a sudden, boink. I, well, I, I know how the Holy Ghost does that. And I sat up in bed, and, so, and I shook the bed so much, Linda woke up. She goes, what's wrong? And I said, I just saw so-and-so in a casket. They're going to die, and within two weeks, they died. Listen to me. Look beyond the person of Bob. Sometimes God is speaking to you. I've had people say, and come and tell me, when I've spoken things, they said, in their minds, they said, who does he think he is? I'm just up here giving a message. I don't know nothing. But see, when the Holy Ghost takes it and there's an anointing on it, it's conviction. Now let's talk about partaking in the non-physical realm. The devil is a master chef. He knows how to cook a delicious meal and feed you spiritually speaking. All he needs is for you to agree to eat it. Well, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Where's that in the Bible? Go into the Garden of Eden. He spoke to Eve and he said, Did God say? He challenged the word of God. Come on, somebody. He challenged God's words. He said, did God really say that? Did he really mean what he said? That in the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you're going to die? He didn't mean that. The devil prepared a nice meal. And when Eve saw that the, food was, that, that the tree was good for knowledge and to make one wise, and that she was going to benefit from it. It says that she took of that. Come on. She came into agreement with the devil. And that one decision threw mankind into chaos. Don't you ever blame God for the, for the woes of this world. It's man's fault. Don't ever blame God for the death of children. It's not God's fault. Don't, bl don't blame God when the schools get shot up and say, God, where were you? How come you didn't prevent this? It's not God's fault. Man way back rebelled against God's authority. Come on, somebody. It was God's authority they rebelled against. They didn't want God anymore in their life. They want to be ruled by their own will, by their own power, by their own reasoning, and not by God's word. And you saw the end result. He tried with Cain and succeeded. He put jealousy in the heart of Cain. And he was humming on Cain. Look at your brother. Who does he think he is? He thinks he's better than you. I'm, I'm paraphrasing because I don't know if that's what the conversation was. But I can surmise what the conversation was. He's better than you. Look at, how your, his, look at how your mother and father favor him over you. You're going to let that happen? Why don't you just kill him? As soon as the agreement pact was made. Come on, somebody. 
You know the end result? He killed his brother. And when God confronted him, what did he say? Am I my brother's keeper? Come on. He made an agreement. The devil tried with Abraham and succeeded. When Abraham was going into the land of promise, into the land of Canaan, there were these, uh, I don't know if they were Hittites, Parasites, or whatever they were. <laughs> Some of you got that. But when he saw them, they were, he was afraid, and he said to his wife, say that you're my sister. Lie! Lie! Can I tell you, every single lie, I don't care how big or how small it is, comes from the father of lies. You can pretend all you want to, but when you lie, you are acting out the very nature of the father, the devil. Getting quiet, Joe. You might have to be my scapegoat. You might have to get me out of here. The greatest lie you could ever receive is lying about your results of disobedience. Nothing's going to happen to you. You're invincible. Nothing's going to happen to you, Joe. You're Joe Fabio, assistant vice president of Mechanics Bank. Nothing's going to happen to you. Come on, somebody. He tried with Joseph's brothers. Come on. He tried with Joseph's brothers, and he succeeded. Jealousy. Father made him a coat of many colors. He walked around with that coat, and every time he did, they said, oh, no. Let our father favors that blinkety blankety blunk, blunk, blunk. We've got to do something. And the devil says, yes, kill him. Kill him. The Bible says the devil is a murderer from the very beginning. It wasn't Cain. It was the agreement Cain made uh, with the devil that killed Abel. That's why Jesus said the devil is a murderer from the beginning. That's the first murder in the Bible. In the beginning. It was Jesus attributed it to Satan, but it was Cain who was the instrument that the devil used. I'm telling you, the devil will use you. Rather than to face the truth and tell somebody the truth, you'll lie. Come on, somebody. And you know what's going to happen? The more, you, the more you tell lies, the more the character of the person that's now convincing you to lie, you're going to become. To the point where you will become an unbeliever and you will doubt God's word. You won't believe one stitch of God's word because all that's happening to you is you're not being formed into the image of Christ. You're being formed into the image of the one who tells you to lie. You've come into an agreement with him. Is this helping anybody? He tried with Moses. Moses, God's prophet. The man of God, the deliverer. Moses, Moses, and succeeded. And God called him. Oh boy, he was all set. Man, I'm called to God. All right, I'm going to deliver God's people. Amen. Praise God. What's that Egyptian fight with my whack? Kills him, buries him in the sand. Then he sees two Hebrews fighting. Goes over there, tries to break him up. One of the Hebrew brothers turns to him and says, man, you hypocrite, what are you doing this for? You, you, I, you just killed that Egyptian and buried him in the sand. And when he found out that the thing was known, he fled. Come on, somebody. Come on. Making agreements. Make an agreement. Here's, here's one of the big ones that work in church today. This is a big one today. I don't need to go to church. Where's that come from? 
Come on, where's it come from? Who doesn't want you to get God's word? Who doesn't want you in God's presence? Who doesn't want you to worship? Oh, oh, but here's the other part of the lie. You can do it at home. My Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, especially as you see the day of Christ coming arriving. See what's happened today? The devil's lied to people. We've come to an agreement where we, church is just an option. If I feel like going, I go. If I don't feel like going, I don't go. That's a deception that the devil has lied to you. Come on, somebody. You put God first. God will put you first. You put God, God last, God will put you last. How would you like it in your time of need? God just said, you know what? I think I'll just wait a little while. You know, maybe, I won't, maybe I won't be faithful in this one this time. You say, well, God doesn't do that. Yes, he does. Read your Bible. He said he'll be faithful to those who are faithful to him. Read your Bible. He did it with Israel. You break my covenant, I'll break my covenant with you. Read your Bible. Know your Bible. Don't sit there in your thoughts saying, where are those thoughts coming from? Hello. Somehow these men and women listened to the enemy and did his bidding. Then he tried it with Jesus, but he failed. Devil, well, the Bible says that the Spirit of God led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. You imagine that? The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, led Jesus into the, into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And he said, if thou be the Son of God. Do you believe that Jesus was the Son of God? People that don't believe that, they listen to the enemy. They come into an agreement with the enemy. Muslims have come to an agreement with, oh, oh, oh watch out now. They've come into agreement with the enemy because they don't believe that he was the Son of God. The Jesus of the Koran, don't be fooled one minute, is not the same Jesus of the Bible. He is the Son of God. But the devil says, if thou be the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. Now let me ask you the question. Could, God, could Jesus have turned those stones into bread? Sure. Why didn't he? Huh? Because he would have proved the devil's statement true. If thou be the Son of God. I don't have to prove to you I'm the son of God. I am the son of God, he said. Come on, somebody. He doesn't have to prove himself to nobody. No devil, no demon, no person. He don't have to prove himself to you. You're not God. Why is he going to prove himself to you? All I read is prove me, he said. How much time I got? Oh, I'm running out of time. Now, you can be sure that if he tried it with Jesus, he's going to try it with you. When you agree with the enemy and what he says, then he can perform the results of that agreement. He can perform the results of that agreement. You've entered a contract, a covenant. You... He can perform the results of the agreement physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. And gets his will done by the action he suggests. And at times you may know it or may not even know it. One of the areas is unforgiveness. Out of the people I've counseled over the years, the one thing people have always said to me whenever I've triggered an, an area of unforgiveness is, I can't right now. You know what I tell them? What if you die walking out of this building? 
What if you die driving your car and you have a heart attack and you die and you slam into a pole and you go into eternity? Because let me tell you something. Jesus said these words, don't fight with me. I don't want to hear no Facebook notes and nothing on this. Jesus said this, if you do not forgive from your heart those who have trespassed against you, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. So you can hold on to bitterness and anger and unforgiveness and all that stuff, and let me tell you, it's killing you. It's, it's killing you. Sometimes the devil will speak to us, and we've made decisions and we've done things in the past, that now we have to live with. How the devil works in that is, says to you, now you're stuck for life. Now you have to endure all this stuff for life. But you know what you need to do? You need to make, break that covenant agreement that you made by disobeying God. Go to God and say, God, I made an agreement with the enemy. I did the wrong that I did. I ask your forgiveness. Now release me from that in Jesus' name. Now you still may have to li live with the results, but you don't have to live under the condemnation the devil throws at you every once in a while. Come on, somebody. That's why some people turn to drugs and alcohol as Christians and go back into the world and try to live for the God, live for the world, live for God, live for the world, live for God, live for the world because they believe the lie. Isaiah 28, 15. This is powerful. Isaiah 28, 15. Because God's talking to the Israelites here and he says this, because you have said, look at that, because you have said, Underline that in your Bible. Because you have said, you spoke it. We have made a covenant with death. It gets worse. And with hell are we at agreement. What is that? Negotiated, typically legal binding agreement between parties as to a course of action. We have made a covenant with death and with hell and, are with, and we are at agreement. And when the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us. Exactly what I said. That'll not happen to me. Some of you may be sitting here, and, and some of you are listening by Facebook might be saying that right. Something might be saying that right to you right now. Oh, that doesn't apply to me. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. When you speak something and you come into an agreement with that thing, it will be a covenant of death and hell. Because that's the ultimate place that God wants to, that the devil wants to bring you. And God wants to save you from that by releasing you. Jesus said it better this way. I have come that you may have life. And that life more abundant. That mean, doesn't mean more cars, more houses. That doesn't mean that. But you have an abundant life of freedom. Second Corinthians chapter six, verse 16 says this. And what and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Now, I, I think it was Lisha when she was opening in prayer, prayed against stubbornness. It was you, right? Lord, don't let us be stubborn. Do you know that stubbornness is as the sin, when it comes to God, is as the sin of idolatry? That's what the Bible says. 
Oh, not me. Yeah, you. Yeah, me. Stubbornness is as the sin of idolatry. Look what it says here. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? What agreement, 2 Corinthians 6, 16, and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? What agreement does your temple have with your stubbornness? Hello? Anybody out there? What's your stubbornness? I don't want to. I don't want to. You're not worshiping God. You're worshiping your opinion. It's become an idol to you. Your stubbornness has become an idol to you. What has that to do with the temple of God? If you are the temple of God and I'm the temple of God, we don't own ourselves. God owns us. Stop playing the Christian thing. Stop playing the Christian. Our lives are not our own. We've been bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore, glorify God in your bodies. He says, what has the temple of God to do with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. And God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And then the next verse says, what? Wherefore, come out from among them. Be separate. Say the Lord, and touch not thee, and I will what? Come on now. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So if you touch the unclean thing, he's not going to. Come on, somebody say it. If you touch the unclean thing, he is not going to receive you. Unsaved people are not are unclean. You should never have a, un, a relationship as a Christian with an unbeliever. Hello? <whistles> Duck that rock. <laughs> Deuteronomy 32, verse 16 and 17 says this. Deuteronomy 32, 16 to 17. And I suggest you go home after and watch this video again. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrifice unto devils, not to God. These people were caught up in idolatry. When you serve an idol, listen to me. When you serve an idol, you are serving demons. When you serve your stubbornness, you're serving demons. Uh-oh. Right? Doesn't God look at stubbornness as a sin of idolatry? Well, if you're worshiping and he looks at it as, a, as, a, as an idol worshiper of your stubbornness, then what's behind the idol? He just said demons. So what's the antidote? Huh? No, don't be stubborn. <laughs> to gods whom they knew not, new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 19 to 21. I'm almost finished. I'm almost finished. I usually don't go this long, but give me another 10 minutes. Who, who give me five more minutes? Five more minutes. Five, five, ten, fifteen, twenty. Okay, twenty-five. Okay, good. What shall I then? What, what say I then? That the idol is anything? Of that which is often in sacrifice to idols is anything? Next verse. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I know, would not that you should have fellowship with devils. First Corinthians 10, 
What's that? 20, 20, 20, verse 20, right? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice the devils, not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. Who is the first one to rebel? Who was the first one to rebel? Satan. He rebelled against what? What did he rebel against? Huh? Thank you, Darren. He rebelled against God's authority, what God said. Hello? And if our stubbornness is keeping us from what God said, we are serving that stubbornness and we are serving that demon that is telling you it's okay for you to hold on to that stubbornness. I'm sure this is not a message on how to influence people and win friends. You cannot, verse 21, drink, listen, you cannot, say cannot. You cannot, some of you won't say it, that's okay. But you cannot, I don't care whether you say it or not, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You can't be a partaker of the Lord's table and the table of devils. You see, the devil has a table that he sets, figuratively I'm speaking now, of course, and presents to you what looks good, and he wants you to partake of it. Don't be fooled. One more scripture to look at. 1 Samuel 11, verses 1 to 2. I'm sorry, I lied. Two more scriptures. I'm sorry, I lied again. Three more scriptures. It wasn't with the intent to deceive, though, I'll tell you that. 1 Samuel 11, verse 1 and 2. Then Nahash, the Ammonite, came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said unto Nahash, make an agreement. That's what the word covenant means. Make a, a, an agreement with us. And what will happen? We will serve you. Now, I preached this message, I think, years ago. Some of you probably don't even remember it. You know what the word Nahash means in Hebrew? Serpent. You got it in your Bible? <laughs> Nahash means serpent. Then the serpent of the Ammonite came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said unto the serpent, the one behind Nahash, make a covenant with us and we'll serve you. Next verse. And Nahash the Ammonite answered them, on this condition... On this condition, I'll make a covenant with you. I'll make an agreement with you. But on one condition, that I may thrust out all your right eyes and lay it for a reproach upon all Israel. Do you ever stop to wonder why the right eye? Because most people, most, are right-handed. So when they fight, the sword is in their right hand. Need this. And they hold the shield up. And they fight from the shield, protecting the shield, and they fight this way. So if you take out the right eye, it takes out the ability to fight. Make a covenant with the serpent, he'll take your ability to fight. And the serpent is more cunning and crafty than any other creature that God made. He's slick. Comes in all nice and flowery, all nice. 
weaves his way in, spits out the lie, and you bite it, and you take it. You made a covenant. And the more you do that, the more you compromise, the more you turn away from the things of God, and you keep running into the world and doing the worldly things and, and associating with worldly people, when he says, come out from among them and don't touch the unclean thing, and you just go right ahead and do it, you have listened to the serpent. And you said, it's okay. Don't get fanatical. You know what's kept me all these years? Being separated. You know why I didn't backslide? After when I was first young, I backslid. But after that, for almost 30, 34 years, 35 years, I haven't backslid. And you know why? Because I know better now. I'm not making any covenant agreement with the enemy. He ain't taking my right eye out. I got to fight. Sometimes I got to fight. Exodus 23, 32 says this. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, no agreement or with their gods. Covenant means agreement. Now, thou shalt make no covenant. What is that? Is that God's suggestion or is that God's command? Thou shalt make no agreement with them, nor we're with their gods. I went by the Catholic church this morning about 10 past 8, quarter past 8. They were all, you know, they had the early service and they had the later service. All the people were coming out. I said, look at that. People at the Catholic Church at quarter past eight in the morning, they probably had to get there for seven, okay? And they're all coming out, all for a lie. All for a lie. And we can't even get people to come to church here. What's that tell you? I'm not making fun of the church. Understand what I'm talking about. If you see the hypocrisy in the very names that they named their churches. Right here. St. Mary of Mount Carmel. Was it St. Mary? Is that, no, what is it? What, what's, no, it's not. No, it's not. There, there's another saint attached to Mount Carmel. And it, I think it's Mary. Look at, look at on the statue they got out there. And the, the plaque that's there. I think it says St. Mary of Mount Carmel. First of all, Mount Carmel was a mountain of false gods. Where Elijah went and he confronted the prophets of Baal. It was the worship of Baal on Carmel. Why would you want to associate your church with something pagan? A place where they worshiped a false god. Make no covenant. I'm going to close with Amos 3.3. 3. You listen to unsaved people. You listen to people that don't love God and don't have any interest in God, and you listen to them and you give in to what they say. Guess what? You made an agreement with the enemy. Before you know it, the things of God are no longer important to you. Church is no longer important to you. You know how many people I've had come to me and say, you know, God's telling me to move on. I said, where are you going to? Oh, I don't know. Okay. Where are they today? Many of them are backslid. Always looking for an excuse. Well, I'm sorry, you won't find no excuses here. You're going to find true love right here. And I'm going to tell you the truth. Whether you like me, you hate me, you want to kick me, whatever you want to do, but don't kick me, please. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Now, I always thought that meant about two people, but it doesn't. Can two, meaning you and God. How can you walk with God if you don't agree with what he says? You can't. Never happened. 
I don't care about your opinion. I don't care about what you think. God's word tells me it's impossible. You cannot walk together except you be in agreement. Kids in the window, bang, bang, bang. <laughs> That's right, knock on the ark. You can't come in. The doors are closed. Maybe, Tom, you can play a little something in the background, or maybe uh, Jesse can play a little something in the background. I don't know if you know where it is, but I want to ask you a question this morning. Are you walking in agreement with God? Or are you listening to the enemy of your soul who wants to rob, steal, kill, and look at this word, destroy. He wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy your faith. He wants to destroy your blessings. He wants to destroy your peace. By you coming into an agreement with him. But God says today, don't agree with the enemy. Can two walk together except they be in agreed, you and God. Stop listening to the opinions of man. Stop listening to what they say, whoever they are. Know this word. Get into this word. Know it. The Holy Spirit will begin to work in you. And as he begins to work, yes, it's, sometimes it's a struggle. But you know what? Have the heart to be willing to say, God, I don't want to make an agreement with the enemy. Who whispers to me that God doesn't love me? Like nobody cares about me. Don't listen to those words. They're lies. Believe the Lord. Believe his word. Believe him when he says that he loves you with an everlasting love.